안녕하세요. 매일매일 운동하기를 실천하고 있는 동탄 왕고입니다. 오늘 영어학원 갔다 왔습니다. 그래서 운동 대충 하겠습니다. 아 너무 졸려요. <웃음> 일단은 스트레칭하고 레그레이지만 하면서 뱃살을 빼도록 하겠습니다. 운동할 땐 역시 CNN이죠. Thanks so much for your company. I'm Rosewood Church. Early start is coming up next. You're watching CNN. Have yourselves a great day. The burden of COVID-19 and demand on healthcare systems may be highest in rural areas of the U.S. According to a modeling study published in the journal Nature Medicine, the authors analyzed data on more than 3,100 U.S. counties under a scenario in which 20% of the population of each county gets infected. The authors found several regions in need of additional support, including much of the western part of the country, the northern Midwest, Florida, and northern New England. Those are the areas with the most people over the age of 60, since that group is more likely to have severe symptoms if infected with COVID-19. Future research is needed to consider how other factors that can lead to an increased COVID risk, like pre-existing health conditions or decreased access to medical care, might increase the burden in certain regions. The journey to the top for a successful business in Africa starts with an idea. But how does a concept become a moneymaker? African and global industry leaders share their stories. Sunday on Profit Point in CNN Marketplace Africa in association with Dangote. countries that have done well through this crisis and you know, Germany for example, South Korea for example, you can look at Israel, other countries in Europe like Greece actually have done well. The key to the success has been to understand that this disease is, is bad enough for people really not to want to get it and therefore unless you're taking really tough action at the beginning and locking down, as I say, hard and fast and then combining this with testing on a mass scale, it's very hard to give people the confidence to come back out of it again. I can't see any way out of this other than to get behind the innovations that are now happening so that you can get an on-the-spot test, antigen and antibody, that allows you to decide very quickly what the disease status of an individual is. I'm Max Foster of the Gullfoss Waterfall in Iceland, and this is CNN. I think we are in a good place. I disagree with him. President Trump contradicts his top doctor again as the coronavirus pandemic reaches a new milestone in America. Welcome to our viewers in the United States and around the world. This is Early Start. I'm Christine Romans. And I'm Laura Jarrett. It's Wednesday, July 8th, 5 a.m. here in New York. And this morning, the U.S. setting a new record, the highest single-day count of new coronavirus cases so far. More than 60,000 reported Tuesday, bringing the grand total to nearly 3 million. At least 56 intensive care units in Florida hospitals now at capacity. Hospitalizations in California have reached an all-time high and the positive test rate, how many people are actually getting the virus, jumped by more than two percentage points in Los Angeles. 
Meanwhile, Georgia passed 100,000 total COVID cases, becoming the ninth state to cross that mark. Yet at the same time, President Trump is pushing hard for states to reopen schools across the country. The schools will be open in the fall, and we hope that most schools are going to be open. Uh, we don't want people to make political statements or do it for political reasons. They think it's going to be good for them politically, so they keep the schools closed. No way. So we're very much going to put pressure on uh, governors and everybody else to open the schools. CNN's Erica Hill begins our coverage now with more on that surge in Florida. 43 hospitals in Florida report their ICU beds are now at capacity. Nearly three dozen more are close. If the governor is pushing forward with plans to open schools next month, touting his state's efforts to prepare for the long haul. The whole point of the curve flattening the curve was to make sure we had enough health care capacity. We're in a way better position today uh, to be able to do that. Restaurants in Miami-Dade County told to pull back as hospitalizations there surge. And that curve the governor mentioned looking more like a steep cliff. Though it's not just Florida. Arizona now has the highest number of cases per capita in the country. In Arizona, the cases are rising so rapidly that we cannot even do contact tracing. The epidemic is out of control in the southern part of the United States. Texas just reported more than 10,000 new cases, its highest single day increase. Houston's mayor urging the state's Republican Party to cancel its upcoming convention in his city, scheduled for July 16th. I believe canceling uh, the in-person convention uh, is the responsible action to take. The Texas GOP is still planning to hold the event adding a mask requirement for attendees. Meantime, the Texas <sighs> State Fair canceled for the first time since World War II. The governor now saying he allowed bars to reopen too soon. You have to wonder if they should have ever been open at all because bars really aren't made in a way that promotes social distancing. California's state capitol closed after at least five assembly members tested positive. And a new study finds so-called silent spreaders may account for as many as half of all cases. Even the states that are doing well right now should be on guard because they could be next. Erica Hill, CNN, New York. More now on Arizona, where this morning more than 5,000 people are hospitalized with COVID-19. The state has less than 10% of its ICU beds available. CNN has reporters across the country bringing you the latest. I'm Evan McMorris Santoro in Tucson, Arizona. The latest daily numbers in Arizona show a situation that's only getting worse. The highest daily recorded number of deaths and the highest number of ICU beds in use. 117 dead and only 167 ICU beds left in the entire state. Here in Pima County, home of Tucson, that number has gotten as low as six. As public health officials urge people to wear masks and obey social distancing rules as this state tries to get a handle on a growing pandemic. I'm Bridge Ingress in Hoboken, New Jersey, where a group of movie theaters is now suing the governor of this state for his decision to not allow them to reopen. In the suit, the group says it has a right to reopen. It takes issue with the fact that fitness centers and malls and places of worship are now open at a limited capacity. They wonder what makes them different. Now, on Monday, the state says it doesn't have any plans to reopen anything more anytime soon, considering the COVID-19 transmission rate in this state is at a level it hasn't seen in a couple of months. Governor Murphy had no comment on this suit. I'm Diane Gallagher in Atlanta. New data from the CDC found that at least 91 workers from meat and poultry plants have died from COVID-19 through the month of May. That same data determined that more than 17,300 workers tested positive. Now, this is not comprehensive information here. It only goes through May 31st and only comes from 23 states, but it does give us a better look at the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 in meatpacking plants on people of color. Of the 10,000 workers who tested positive and also disclosed their racial or ethnic identity, 87% were ethnic or racial minorities, with 56% of those oh. identifying as Hispanic. 
I'm Randy Kay in Palm Beach County, Florida. Just a few hours north of here in Jacksonville, Florida, the mayor there, Lenny Curry, is now self-quarantining with his family. This after learning that he came into contact with someone who has now tested positive for COVID-19. The mayor so far has tested negative. Jacksonville certainly in the news because the Republican National Convention will be taking place in that city later this summer. We're just about six weeks away from that. The city has also mandated masks and we will continue to watch the mayor's progress. Thanks to all of our correspondents for those reports. Dr. Anthony Fauci warning against a false sense of security after the president touted the falling COVID-19 death rate in this tweet as proof the virus is under control. Right now, younger people are making up a larger percentage of cases, but the government's top COVID-19 expert cautioned against using misleading metrics. It's a false narrative to take comfort in, in a lower rate of death. There's so many other things that are very dangerous and bad about this virus. Don't get yourself into false complacency. The president rejecting Dr. Fauci's assertion that the U.S. is still, quote, knee deep in the first wave of the pandemic. I think we are in a good place. I disagree with him. You know, Dr. Fauci said, don't wear masks. And now he says, wear them. And, uh, you know, he said numerous things. Don't uh, close off China. Don't ban China. And I did it anyway. I sort of uh, didn't listen to my experts and I banned China. We would have been in much worse shape. Now, Fauci did concede the president's point on experts early waffling about masks. We have to admit it, that that mixed message in the beginning, even though it was well meant to allow masks to be available to health workers, that was detrimental in getting the message across right now. No doubt about it. Fauci also said Tuesday he doesn't think the federal government will mandate everyone taking an eventual vaccine. He says that would encroach on people's health care choices. Coronavirus test re results are taking longer to turn around as cases spike in the United States. Three major diagnostic companies, Quest, LabCorp, and Bioreference Laboratories, say growing demand for tests has increased the average wait time for delivering results. Governor Jay Inslee of Washington blames President Trump. Governors in southern states listen to Donald Trump and they reopened their businesses way too fast and they let thousands of people rush into bars and as a result they've got massive surges, surges of, epi, of pandemics in Texas and Florida and other states. And as a result they put pressure on the analytical labs to get all these testing done. Governor Inslee also says the federal government never provided an adequate number of test kits and when they finally did arrive many were mismatched or packaged improperly. President Trump says the U.S. is not closing and will never close, and as we mentioned earlier, wants schools across the country back open. It's very important for our country. It's very important for the well-being of the student and the parents. So we're going to be putting a lot of pressure on open your schools in the fall. Of course, the elephant in the room, Christine, is that until we get the case count lower in the U.S., it's really hard to have a meaningful conversation about what it would look like to pressure schools to reopen, and there's no strategy on a national level to do that. Exactly. What we didn't hear from the White House yesterday was how. And we heard the president say that some of these schools are closed because it's a political statement against President Trump. Uh, I don't know anybody who's keeping their kids home from school or not opening Ugh. a school because of a personal feeling about President Trump. It's about health and safety. How do we get children back to school safe, safely and teachers? and support staff. A lot of people are very concerned about the health of going back to school. Where's the national plan for what it will look like? I see the pressure, the national pressure on uh, state and local authorities to open schools, but where's the plan? Exactly, the exactly. It's not like they don't want to do it, but they're trying to figure out how to do it safely. And seeing as Caitlin Collins has more on this now. Oh, this is... Yeah, Laura and Christine, it's been pretty clear for several weeks now that Trump does want schools open this fall. But yesterday, as the president was hosting a roundtable with several administrators and teachers, he said he is going to pressure governors to physically reopen their schools in just a matter of weeks. Oh, oh so yeah. the Health officials have voiced concerns about, about how that's going to work logistically, but also now that we are seeing such a surge in cases in certain parts of the country, raising concerns about putting teachers, administrators, and students back in one area.
It comes as Trump has tried to push forward despite uh. the un uptick in numbers, saying that the country must reopen and learn to live with coronavirus, basically. But the question is, you know, how is the administration going to support these schools that need to do this? Yeah, are they going to help provide them with financial assistance or guidance about, you know, do students sit six feet apart? Because we've heard that concern as well from so many school districts that financially they're just not capable of doing the social distancing measures that they believe would be necessary to safely put everyone back in school together. Now, the president said he believes that if there are schools that do not reopen, he believes it's going to be a political statement intended to clearly hurt him, though he didn't offer much reason behind that, because, of course, you've seen several Democrats as well say they would like students to return to school. Their question is just really, how do they do that? Now, this also came on the day that we should know the United States formally notified that they are going to be withdrawing from the World Health Organization, something the president has made clear for several months now that he wants to do. And it came as he was commenting during that roundtable, repeating a claim he's made before that we should note is not correct and isn't backed up by his own health officials. That claim that he says an increase in testing is the reason you're seeing an increase in new cases throughout the country, something health officials, even the ones who work here at the White House, say is not the case. All right, Caitlin, thank you for that. To Business Now, we're learning more about who received loans from the Paycheck Protection Program. A deep dive into a slice of those oh. 8 million loans. Oh. Nearly oh. Oh. Of funds went to healthcare businesses with a total of $67.4 oh. billion. Dollars. Smaller hospitals, primary care doctors, ambulance services received loans as large as $10 million. That's on top of the $175 billion Congress appropriated oh. for hospitals to reimburse them for coronavirus related expenses and lost revenue. At the very same time, big banks stand to earn uh, hundreds of millions of dollars from PPP loan fees. Analysis from S&P Global shows more than 30 community banks could earn as much from the fees as they reported in net revenue for all of 2019, a windfall of taxpayer funds. JP Morgan Chase, which issued the most PPP loans of any bank, could make more than $800 million in fees. Again, that's taxpayer money. The optics, well, they look a little bad, but people who support the program say, America's banks have been a lifeline for businesses during this pandemic. The Fed says banks are in better shape to weather the storm, unlike during the Great Recession. All right, well, Brazil's leader, Jair Bolsonaro, used to dismiss the dangers of coronavirus. Now, he can't. That's next. might be known for his quick moves as the Seattle Seahawks quarterback, but off the field, the Super Bowl champion has been helping his community during the pandemic and motivating others. I can inspire you guys in any way. First thing is love big. You know, the second thing is to serve big. And the third thing is to forgive big. Alongside his wife, singer Sierra, the two have already donated more than one million meals to help feed those struggling in the Seattle area. They also offered a double date night in the All In Challenge, a fundraising auction to help fight food insecurity due to the virus. Their date night raised nearly a quarter of a million dollars for the cause. Many other stars are All In, including Tom Brady, 
His auction, which included a dinner or workout, game tickets and game worn jersey, collected $800,000 for relief efforts. For more information on how you can help during this pandemic, go to cnn.com slash impact. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has tested positive for COVID-19 after dismissing the virus for months as a little flu. Bolsonaro says he started to experience muscle pain, fatigue, and a fever on Sunday. He was sent to the hospital for a lung scan. After testing positive for coronavirus, Bolsonaro says he will steer clear of face-to-face -face meetings and now concedes the disease could be deadly. We get more from CNN's Bill Weir in Sao Paulo. Christine, Laura, good morning from Sao Paulo. Yes, uh, Brazil confirmed 45,305 new cases of COVID-19 on Tuesday, and among them, the man in charge of Brazil. Uh, the president, Jair Bolsonaro, after famously or infamously poo-pooing this pandemic, uh, admitted that he, in fact, is infected. But those who were expecting a changed man uh, were disappointed. We know last night he had enough of a fever, enough symptoms to go to a medical hospital or military hospital uh, in the capital and get his lung uh, scan with an MRI machine, also had his at least fourth COVID-19 test. And then today around noontime, he stepped out in front oh, of the presidential yeah. palace with the mask and said, yes, I have it. I've been tested for it. But what's interesting is, is how he treated that announcement. Uh, if you want to know what... Uh, you know, Jair Bolsonaro is going to do during this pandemic, ask yourself, what would Donald Trump do? He's done many things and then gone steps beyond. And today he sort of turned it into a commercial for hydroxychloroquine, this controversial anti-malarial drug uh, that he says is already making him feel better. He also said young people should have no problems going back to work. Don't worry about it. Uh, uh, both things in sort of conflict with health ministers and doctors around the country. About 1,250 deaths were confirmed on Tuesday. Uh, those numbers usually lag by four or five weeks behind the infection numbers as well. So the cemetery tells me they've dug 8,000 graves and may have to dig more. Let me send it back to you. Bill Weir, thank you so much for that report. Major League Soccer in the U.S. gets back underway in a matter of hours, but not for all the teams. Please report what's next. <laughs> COVID-19 is a new disease. Scientists, researchers, healthcare workers, and others are working together to better understand the virus, how it spreads, and how we can protect ourselves, our loved ones, and everyone else. But science changes and evolves over time. And even though changes may seem confusing, they are for our good. So be open to changes, new facts and recommendations. Let's all prevent the spread of COVID-19. From local radio to the White House to a worldwide audience, CNN's Michael Smirconish has had a heck of a ride. Join Michael for an entertaining and poignant look at his one-of-a-kind career. Things I wish I knew before I started talking. Sunday on CNN. My name is 
is Adetoye Adesi. I'm from Benin Republic. I'm the founder and CEO of Ridecom Technology, and Ridecom is a customer experience management company. We have offices in four countries. I recently became a first-time father. Now that we have a baby, there was a lockdown. I found myself spending most of the time, and in fact, all the time yeah, at your home. So I had more time to spend with my child. And that's what we have to do oh, as, <laughs> as, as a parent. And <laughs> <try> <laughs> As much as I can, I want to make my, 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 my child happy and safe, and at the same time to fulfill to my commitments. People understand that there 